Hi, hello, good evening, and welcome to another uh, episode of Beyond the Balcony, this time in uh, accession countries, uh, meaning non-EU countries. Uh, and we have with us here members from uh, Serbia, from Northern Macedonia and Albania. Uh, we are hoping that uh, this episode will bring us more members and uh, that it will energize and motivate uh, much more of uh, DMRs to, to come forward. As uh, we are facing a very long road of uh, a session for some, quite some time and uh, the roadblocks are piling up on our way and while we are trying to, to overcome this, uh, the European Union is obviously falling apart. Uh, what is our position in this uh, Europe? What is uh, DiEM's position? What to do <laughs> with us? And um, what are our action points and what are the benefits of our countries in terms of our uh, sovereignty of national banks and uh, national currency are some of the topics that we would like to tackle this evening. Without further ado, uh, I will give the floor to Yanis for a brief introduction, and then we will make a round of interventions. Yanis, please. Well, thank you, Vanna. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's, um, yeah, I'm at home. I'm in my backyard. Um, Serbia, Northern Macedonia, um, Albania, you know, that's it's like saying I'm at home, right? <laughs> uh, we used to be together in a variety of empires, uh, you know, bonded together, bound together without any borders. You know, the idea of borderlessness uh, is not a new one. <laughs> it's an ancient one. There, were no, there was no such notion of a border um, back in the days of the Ottoman Empire, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. Um, <clears throat> even, you know, people from the godforsaken island of Britain, when they used to visit our neck of the woods, well, they didn't need passports, you know? <laughs> you know, this is what um, our Brexiteer friends need to remember. That, and, and, and allow me to just uh, exploit um, a misphrase by Yuvana. Um, to say that, um, you know, you ask the question, okay, so what did, what is DiEM going to do you, do with you lot? You know, the, you know Serbs and Albanians and Northern Macedonians who are not, who belong to countries that are not members of the EU. I shall have to rephrase it, as you can imagine. What are we going to do? Because in DiEM we're all together, and DiEM is not about the European Union, it's about Europe. This is what we're telling our, our friends in Britain. We don't give a damn, we don't recognize Brexit. You know, you're parts of DiEM because we are the democracy in Europe movement. We are not um, the Komsomol of the European Union bureaucracy. For those, for those of you who remember what the Komsomol used to be, because you're too young. I look at most of you and you're far too young. You know, this is just something you've got to change because you make people like me feel decrepit and ancient. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. Right? Um, look, um, the, the, the Serbia, Albania, North Macedonia are very, very interesting cases at the moment. Because here you have countries that are uh, emerging from a variety of nightmares, uh, whether that was civil war, um, you know, mafia-ridden regimes, a bit like this, um, the devastation of um, former Yugoslavia, you carry with you all this richness of um, you know, an internationalist agenda. Because all three countries were part of an internationalist bloc, at least officially. The prevailing ideology was one of internationalism. And now you come knocking on the door, or not you, your governments. They come knocking on the door of the European Union. A European Union which is disintegrating, as Ivan aptly put it. And which is treating North Macedonia, Albania, and Serbia as um, instruments. Instruments in internal clashes. So President Macron of France is pretending to have a degree of autonomy from Angela Merkel of Germany. 
by saying no to like, the exception of your countries uh, when he really doesn't give a damn. Um, he has um, um, surrendered on every front in which he ever contested anything with Berlin. And now he is um, using you as pawns in order to, mm, not you again, your countries, your governments, your polity. Uh, at the same time, there's something assorted about um, Skopje, Belgrade, Tirana, going cap in hand and saying, please, please let us in. Um, there's something sorted about that. Look, we messed up the European Union seriously badly. Uh, and it happened um, well, from, from the very beginning. It's, it's a mistake to say that this is a splendid, I mean, we even said in the manifesto, now I'm, re, I'm changing my mind. Uh, we say that oh, it was a fantastic enterprise and somewhere along the line, it went wrong. It is true that there were fantastic sentiments at play. No more war. Let's have solidarity. Let's bind together. Let's find a common um, area of uh, shared prosperity. That's all fantastic. But the, the hard reality behind that beautiful ideal was a cartel of big business. The first name of the European Union was the European Com Community of Coal and Steel, like in you know, OPEC the organization of petroleum exporting countries. That was the depth of the ideology, ideology of the bureaucracy in Brussels. The bureaucracy in Brussels was set up to run a bloody cartel, you know, just like OPEC. Um, this, is, this is, no nation state has come into being like that. No government's come into being like that. This is a unique experiment. Um, so, you know, governments, countries, countries, states, emerged as a result of a conflict, a social class conflict, a conflict between the peasants and the landowners, between the emerging commercial class, the bourgeoisie and the, and the landowners, um, later on the financiers and so on. So they, were, they needed a political apparatus. That's what created the, the state of Serbia, the state of Greece, the state of Germany, the state of the United States. And that, it was an inevitable institutional uh, agglomeration, the purpose of which was to ameliorate class conflicts. In the case of the European Union, it wasn't. The case of the European Union was, okay, so how, how do we ensure that the steel producers of Germany and France and Italy and Belgium have the same interests and they share uh, oligopoly profits? So a bureaucracy that is created to do that is not a bureaucracy that can easily be democratized. So when we found the DiEM25 in 2016 and we said, the European Union will democratize, will be democratized, or it will perish, or it will disintegrate. We were right. But it won't happen as a result of a series of reforms. So the critics of the M25 from the left, from the Eurosceptic left, from the Lexiteer left, from those who were saying, you know, this European Union is dead in the water, it sucks, we might as well do away with it and support Brexit, Grexit, Italexit, and so on. Um, you know, they had a point, but they were wrong. The point they had was that, yes, it is true, this European Union is not reformable. It's well beyond being reformed. But they were wrong to think that you can create a genuinely internationalist, transnational, progressive movement out of this call for disintegrating an awful set of European institutions. We were always right, I think, about this. But now, especially after the European Parliament elections, and especially after the pathetic response to the coronavirus depression, coming our way by the European Union institutions. Uh, even the bourgeois supporters of the European Union are now finding it very hard to articulate arguments in favor of the European Union's responses. Uh, we have to be more radical. And we have to understand, I say this, I've been saying this now for a month or so, um, that the establishment of the European Union is quite ready and willing to destroy the European Union to serve the oligarchy. If that's what it takes for them to continue to serve the oligarchy, they will blow the European Union up. Uh, they have no compunction. They wrap themselves in the flag of the European Union, in the stars and you know the blueness of the EU flag, but they are quite happy to do this to the European Union the moment the interests of the financiers, the car makers, um, the you know um, large conglomerates, uh, Siemens, and so on, the moment those interests are jeopardized, they will destroy the European Union or they will let it die. We should be the same. It sounds cynical, but it isn't. Because we are in here, in, in this, 
to, uh, for the people of Europe. We are here for um, th those who are going to suffer immense austerity, whether we are talking about Serbia or, or Greece or Germany or, or France for that matter. Uh, we are never going to go out there and propose the disintegration of the European Union or actually exiting it. Uh, but we, on the other hand, are not going to be cowed into to submission by a commission or a troika that threatens us with exit, um, showing us the door or not letting us in, as in the case of Serbia, North uh, Macedonia and Albania, when we should not be cowed by these threats. Do your worst should be our motto. And uh, we should be prepared to realize that the oligarchy treats the institutions of the European Union as instruments. We should use them as instruments and we should try to transform those instruments. And if it means sacrificing them in the process, if we can't use them or transform them, let's be prepared for that. This is time for DiEM25 to move into its second phase, into a more radical phase. We tried the Green New Deal. Uh, we're going to keep trying the Green New Deal because it's very important to go to the establishment and say, look, this is what you could do today to make everybody's life better and to save the planet. Uh, you're not doing it. We don't expect you to be convinced by our arguments, even if you recognize the merits in the Green New Deal that we are pushing forward, because you're not interested in that. You're interested in continuing to press the interests of the oligarchy. But you know, we show Europeans what could be done in order to elicit uh, rage amongst them for the fact that it's not being done and to gather their strength with us, you know, to add it to our strength in order to confront and clash with the European Union institutions and therefore transform this European Union, um, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And I conclude. So this leaves, if I'm right, if I'm right, I'm not saying I'm right, if I'm right, um, how do we treat, how do we treat, what is our answer to the question of Serbs, of Albanians, and North Macedonians? Okay, what do we do about accession? Do we want to, to get into the European Union or do we say, hang on a second, guys, let's think about it. Like the Turkish government has taken a step back saying, you know, this is not necessarily a club we want to be members of. Uh, I don't have the answer to that. We have to work it out together, together as DMS, <clears throat> collectively. Um, and of course, there's the question of the euro, because there's no doubt your elites want to be members of the euro. And there's no doubt that they will use the same tired arguments they used here in 2000 to get us into the euro. Personally, I think that you've got to be mad to get into the euro now. You've got to be mad, bad and sad to want to get into the euro now. Uh, and people say, oh, what? well, in that case, why are you not advocating the exit of Greece from the euro? And this is how I end. It's not the same thing to say we should not go, uh, we, sh we should not have gone in and saying you should get out. It's not the same. Uh, if this was 1999, just like in 1999, I campaigned against Greece's entry into the euro. Once you are in, you've got to consider the costs of getting out. But your countries are not in, and I think it would be crazy to get in. Of course, you know, you've got to take into consideration the fact that if you do get in, then you're effectively, at least in law, on paper, you're committing to entering the euro as well at some point. Uh, and that's, you know, something that uh, we should uh, you know in interrogate politically thank you so much for listening to me and i'm sorry if i spoke too long thank you very much janice because i think you touched upon uh, the whole spectrum of the questions that we want to to, to touch here. Um, speaking about radicality, I think uh, that this uh, environment is a perfect uh, soil for being more radical and for really understanding the um, urgency of doing something and moving things forward and changing things. Uh, what we have done, for example, here in Belgrade from day one was uh, to advocate for EU, but not this EU. Uh, we have this uh, lucky number of uh, uh, admission date, like 2025, which is the number in DiEM25. And uh, the dream is that DiEM will get into the European par Parliament with, I don't know, six parties. And then when we are supposed to enter the European Union, 
EU Parliament will be full of DM parties. Wouldn't that be a dream? Um, Europe will democratize or it will perish is kind of became soft. So I know that my comrades from here uh, like the new slogan, much better, unify or die. And um, having said that, I don't want to take uh, much time. Uh, who would like the floor? Vladimir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vladimir Kunovsky. I came from uh, DSC Skopje. I'm a part of uh, DM uh, since 2018. Maybe the most active in uh, my DSC. Hi. Uh, I want to uh, ask everybody. So we had a uh, we had a experience in Yugoslavia uh, being a part of a family. So being part of EU is being a part of dysfunctional family. So I know it's better to be a part of family. Uh, although it is a dysfunctional family at the moment, uh, my first point. Uh, but uh, from our point of view, uh, I want to, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's all over ex-Yugoslavia, including Albania and Kosovo. The situation, uh, I, I must point out the three things. First of all, we are uh, uh, living in uh, neo-feudalism neo uh, uh, because the old, party members, the old managers of the factories became the new oligarchy, political and business oligarchy. So we are, uh, there is a step back in our life. So like, uh, uh, it feels like in the 50th century, it's only, only, the, uh, only the technology is a bit different. So the second thing is neo-colonialism. The first line of neo-colonialism neo of European, uh, of EU uh, businesses, corporations and American corporation is not in Africa or in uh, or in China or Indonesia. It's on the Balkan countries because you have here salaries like 200 euros, 300 euros, and you have a uh, you have like companies that are making 100 million euros profit per year. Uh, and another thing is that uh, the, these golden chickens are sold to uh, to Deutsche Telekom or uh, to Hellenic Petroleum. Uh, and there, there are even criminal charges on the, uh, let's say for Deutsche Telekom, buying Macedonian Telekom and Montenegrin Telekom, they have a, a, sub, uh, they have a, a case on, uh, I think, in New York uh, court. They lost the case uh, for uh, corruption, but here there is no uh, people who are charged, especially politicians. Although there are many, uh, many um, uh, how to say, many things uh, that are uh, we know who are uh, to blame but uh, the court is not uh, uh, there are many uh, people who are uh, who are supposed to be charged but nobody's charged uh, and the, the the third thing i think uh, uh, we should all agree is stabilocracy uh, ruling of stability over rule of law uh, which uh, especially you um, uh, eu politicians uh, EU bureaucracy and EU uh, ambassadors in uh, uh, in the sending countries are uh, used to uh, play play very well. So uh, we, as a citizens, are losing uh, any any hope that uh, the uh, the the help will come from EU entering EU. The, that's why, uh, in the eyes of local people, um, they love Salvini, they love Viktor Orban. They love, they love Erdogan or Putin. So there are many uh, me wrong messages coming from EU. So uh, once again, neo-feudalism, neo-capitalism and stabilocracy. So that's my point of view. Uh, maybe uh, somebody from Serbia or from Albania will uh, take on. Thank you. Yes, unfortunately we are in this position of uh, co colonial states of uh, Europe. And uh, the, the question is, how do we get out of uh, that colonial position and uh, awful austerity? Zoran, please. Hi, everybody. Uh, Zoran Sokolovsky from Belgrade, uh, member of DM25 in Serbia since the beginning of our uh, long trip together. Um, just, just to add to Twitter, I mean, I, I agree with the, um, Vladimir, everything he said is, is, is point on. Um, 
Also, uh, Yanis gave a re really good introduction about the state of the EU and how it came to existence and what we have right now as to um, joining or not joining or uh, exiting or not exiting. Um, so maybe just a short political economical picture. Um, uh, there are no uh, positions in Serbia, there are no political positions in Serbia which are not run by, by the same centers of power. So it's very easy to see because in all their programs, it's either EU or EU. And I'm talking about the people who always uh, come to power somehow um, uh, through the elections. So it's very obvious, as Yanis said, that uh, if, if, we, if, if we once uh, vote to have a referendum about EU and, um, <clears throat> and we join by any chance, which I, which I really, really, really doubt, um, but let's say uh, let's say we join. Um, it will be it will be moment of probably not even years, but months when these guys will push for uh, uh, for your, uh, uh, making euro uh, um, uh, the main uh, currency actually uh, going into the eurozone. So then we're in the same position, um, but we don't have not even a little bit of advantage on on, on a working class or, or on, on people who are on the streets. Who are suffering right now immensely um, by joining, we actually are on such a level that it would be much more easier to keep that level suppressed and people suppressed even easier than before. So that is my uh, that is my worry, uh, if I can say. Um, although I really don't think uh, that, that that it will happen, it's actually relevant for us whether we're part of EU or not, um, because the people who are exchanging power, I'm talking about Serbia now, in the last 20, 30 years, are actually doing more or less the same thing. Um, so this situation where we're all in like, like, like colonies, like, like, uh, like uh, foreign direct investments, I mean, Serbia was number one in the world uh, last year, according to the Financial Times, as, as a country with the most amount of foreign direct investments, and the results are catastrophic. Um, Yes, uh, huge companies came, they opened uh, uh, positions uh, for two, 300 euros and 16 hour shifts in a beautiful landscape where you can do so many other things, but, but mounting cables. Uh, a lot of people left the country uh, in the same time uh, as, they, as they're leaving all the time. So we have this like a washing machine of um, people who cannot leave or who do not have education, which is by the way, given for free from the government. Uh, they stay and they get stuck with those jobs. And people who are uh, um, um, better educated, they actually go for a little bit higher salaries uh, to fill the jobs uh, in Germany or Austria or wherever else. So yeah, that's just I just wanted to 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 get a little bit of a picture before before we go in. Uh, uh, so that's all for me for now. Again, unfortunately, this is something very common for all of our countries, uh, the brain drain and um, cheap labor force. Uh, I have a stack from Milena. Milena, please take the floor. Let me unmute myself. Thank you. I think, yeah, uh, you, you will raise very, very valid points, but I'd like to come back to the question of accession. And there is one thing that is commonly uh, left out of the accession issue, and it's so thoroughly European, and that is democracy. Basically, accession should be a democratic process, as in a people, a country should decide whether they want or do not want to be the part of the EU. And everyone says that it's supposed to happen like that, but as we saw in North, Northern Macedonia, you had three issues in one issue, the name NATO and the European Union, and it was a legitimate referendum, even though only, I'm not sure how many, but around 30% of the people actually voted on the referendum. So basically nobody asks, uh, it's left to the political elites of both the accession countries and the EU, not to the peoples of, of the either side. And that's basically the way in which European Union operates. But, and when we speak about that, when we speak about what the people want, 
since 2008, the support for joining the European Union uh, in Serbia dropped dramatically. Uh, and it is difficult to hold the stance that we want to reform the European Union after we join it, because you have a polarizing yes or no, especially because it's very enmeshed with the question of Kosovo in, in Serbia. So basically people ask you, what do you think about uh, the independence of Kosovo and what do you think about the EU? And none of those are simple questions and you're required to have a simple yes or no answer to each of them. So <clears throat> from that perspective, I would like to, to, to hear like everyone's opinion on how DiEM should approach in, in the accession countries uh, the issue of joining the European Union. Uh, I think the example of Greece in 2015 is actually very instructive in that. Whereas if you say we will not join the EU today, uh, the ball is in your court, and then you're the one who's anti-European, who's I don't know what. But if you actually negotiate and show step by step that the European bureaucracy will not let you decide uh, the workers' rights in your country, decide uh, your economy, decide how much you will uh, invest in your healthcare system, because we've seen what not investing in the healthcare system means during the COVID crisis. I think that's, that could be one way of, of presenting and understanding the stance of the in accession countries towards the accession process. That's pretty much all. Very true. This position of black or white, yes or no, is quite often the choice that we have. Uh, less less evil, and uh, we are labeled here. If you're like saying that uh, it's not the best idea to join the EU right now, you're labeled as an anti-Europeanist or whatever. And you know this way to Europe and European values is as is something we never uh, even had. Uh, good point. Uh, I think it was an excellent point about uh, being able to influence the negotiations, but Yanis knows how the negotiations with the European institutions look like. And uh, when we started, uh, our transparency pillar was what we, you know, tried to catch on and to try to open the process of negotiations and make that transparent because we don't know what's being signed uh, in Brussels in our name. Now I have Eric. Eric, please. Cheers, Ivana. Um, very briefly from my side, I think although the point on negotiation is very relevant and very important, uh, if there's one thing that we've learned from the past 10 years of EU history is that the European Union is a structure that's not fit for purpose. Um, it's not a, it, it doesn't fail to negotiate, it's incapable of negotiating. It is not designed to be able to negotiate because in order to negotiate, you need to have a pl pl plurality of options based on, you know, democracy, dialogue and so on, which the EU is not designed to have. It cannot negotiate. It's, the state it is in is because it's so precarious, this structure of coordinating all these member states is so delicate, so impossibly designed, um, that to introduce uh, uh, negotiations, for example, would cause it to collapse. That is because essentially the European Union is a structure for the continuation of international relations through other means. You know, von Clausewitz called war the continuation of diplomacy through other means. The European Union is the continuation of international relations through other means. It's got a fig leaf of democracy, as we often say in, in Diem, but essentially what it is, is another vessel for the interests of different governments to be played out um, behind closed doors. This isn't an institution with which you can negotiate. That's not what it's been designed to do. So the whole idea would be to, at the same time, to start having a mentality of there is not much beyond the European Union, although I agree, or be, be beyond, I should say, a united Europe, not the European Union. 
Because if you think about it, the Ancien Regime, right, uh, in the 1700s, that was a system absolutely designed to profit the elites. It was absolutely 100% the result of an ideology that came from the Middle Ages of feudalism and so on that only profits the elite versus and exploits everybody else. I mean, the European Union is in many ways a continuation of such a project, although not as extreme. So at the same time, when people had a French Revolution, they didn't try to leave France, right? The idea was to take over France, to take over the structures of power. And it's exactly, that is the sort of approach that we need to have towards the European Union. We, we, we can't leave Europe. There's nowhere to go. And at the same time, there's no alternative to cooperation in a world that is increasingly only facing global issues, whether it is climate catastrophe, the influx of uh, people on the move, um, whether it's you know, globalized capital and so on, that you, we need something like the European Union, but we need to democratize it. So I think it's really important that we, we keep that in mind, that the project always needs to end up with a united Europe, whether that needs the destruction of the current EU um, and the disaster that would follow such a move, or whether it means taking it over. But there's no alternative to those two options. It always needs, the end goal always needs to be a united Europe. United Europe is something that we uh, like much, much more, the sound of it. CC. Uh, Yes, um, uh, starting with Eric's uh, last sentence, I would I would like very much to focus on it and um, simply say that the conflation of Europe with the EU is one of the most culturally, culturally and politically uh, dangerous neo-colonial gesture that I've seen in my life. And even us, have fallen victim to this identification between Europe and the EU. The only way of getting above this and beyond this is United Europe. Uh, the cultural and political imperialism has absolutely uh, penetrated uh, the public uh, consciousness uh, to the extent that even us in Greece, who have joined the EU so many decades, speak of you, uh, the other European countries as Europe. We say we go to Europe as if we don't belong in Europe. Uh, it's something horrendous. Uh, it, it shows that this, uh, this is uh, and the absolute sort of uh, political domination of this structure uh, or, uh, upon every one of us. And I think uh, we have to um, uh, start an important campaign against this identification. If we don't stop identifying the EU with Europe, we are lost. Uh, that's my first point. The second point is I totally ag agree with Vladimir in what he said about the three uh, uh, kind of points, especially uh, what he called um, uh, Europe, uh, uh, European neocolonialism. Neo in fact, um, um, the Greek capitalist oligarchy uh, made important effort in the past before the crisis and the memoranda imposed on our country to expand on Bulgaria as it did on Northern Macedonia. So it's not just, you know, uh, the, uh, let's say the, the international heavy, heavy capitalism that uh, found in these countries um, a terrain, a land of exploitation because of the low salaries and the rest, Okay, it's even uh, uh, the local, or not local, the national oligarchies of weaker member states like Greece. Um, in my opinion, um, the only, um, okay, uh, as for ref uh, the reforms of the European Union, Yanis um, and uh, Eric have already covered this. 
uh, no, you cannot reform the European Union. Um, within the European Union, you can exist as a pariah state, the way to which Greece was reduced by the austerity policies, the memoranda, when we lost all kinds of sovereignty from national sovereignty, and sorry to use the word national, but there is such a thing, okay, national economic sovereignty. The worst form of bio biopolitics was exerted on Greece with the incredible impoverishment of the people, uh, the, the rise in uh, the uh, death, um, uh, uh, sorry, sorry the, the, the drop of the life expectancy in Greece and the brain drain. So uh, the European Union doesn't safeguard uh, its countries, its member states from this kind of disasters. This is the bitter lesson we learned in Greece because of the memoranda. And for the memoranda, you need two parties to walls. You need the EU and you need the local oligarchy because memoranda and austerity uh, is the best means for the local capital, the national capital, to, uh, to make profit. Uh, and this is not stopped by membership in the EU. And I'm closing with this. Uh, the only point, and I'm simply stating this, uh, I'm asking you, because obviously you know so much better the situation in your countries than me. I mean, if there is um, uh, an important reason for, uh, for sorry, what's this? for uh, joining the EU, it might be a, a reason having to do with a wider sense of political stability. Perhaps, I mean, uh, joining the EU would stabilize uh, democratic and parliamentary processes uh, within the countries. For example, I mean, uh, talking about Northern Macedonia, I know that they, I mean, I know, have read, I've watched, I've, I've been to the place, and I spent some time there. Uh, the, I mean, the fragility of, 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 of the state is quite quite big because there are minorities and Skopje might turn out to become, and the whole of uh, Northern Macedonia, but I'm referring to Skopje because I saw it visibly inscribed in the body of the town in Skopje, uh, the division between uh, the Albanian part of the party uh, and the rest. I mean, this is visibly even, even you know, in the city planning and city allocations. Uh, I mean, Turkey is very much interested in, in uh, playing a role in uh, uh, North Macedonia and perhaps accession uh, and joining the EU might help countries to stabilize themselves internally. But I'm simply, this is a suggestion and I would like perhaps somebody to respond to this because I really don't know. This is what I imagine. Thank you. Uh, Srečko has a good joke that Croatia joined the uh, European Union when the party was uh, coming to an end. And if we ever join, it's going to be when everybody's gone from the party. So it's what we are having now, right? Uh, but a gr very good point, uh, Sisi, about the fragility of states, which were you know, devastated through decades and uh, now are being definitely thrown apart by the corrupted governments, which are not the governments, they are basically cartels, mafia cartels. Um, I have uh, Christian. Christian, please. Yes, um, good evening. I want, I want to be critical and I want to be very, very like, straightforward. Uh, to me, there is no democracy without transparency. There is no European Union having countries in the Europe continent outside of them. So what they are talking about? What are they talking about so long? Uh, don't get me wrong. I want to speak very sincerely about this. That the, the, For me personally, the, the, the things are going from economic problems and, and danger to psychological danger. 
I see this in, in Albania as well. Uh, it's corruption. It's everywhere. In every point of the country, in every single angle, even in the most, the most bottom level of, of our society. Because it's been decades and decades that people are educated in some point, unconsciously, about this kind of behavior and, and perception of life and, and governments and, and societies. So I believe that we are stuck a lot, what I see, maybe I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, that all, the whole Europe and the whole world is stuck to the analysis. It's always doing and, and putting too much power in the diagnosis of the situation of how we are here, but it's clear, it's clearly known that we came from somewhere here. So we know it. We have to put much more power to or going forward to find solution and to speak about solution and to move them and to move them as, as fast as we can and as better as we can. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm always seeing uh, politics from outside because I'm an artist. I studied in Greece and in Scotland. I've lived there as well. Uh, since two, 2019, the last year we started, me and my friends started a movement in Albania. Uh, we have a radical ideas, as DM25 has, have, 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 has radical ideas, because the change, the transformation of our world, our life, because I see the world as, as one house for all of us. I don't, I don't believe in borders. It's a matter of language and a matter of communication. As Yanis said, we, we, in, in Balkans, we, we've been together. There were no borders. We, 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 we can learn our language so fast now, with, like the new generation now. And we should speak for something new. We should always uh, direct our uh, people, our, our fa families, friends, to how find solutions, how we can find solutions. How can we cooperate together and transform the whole world? Can we do this? Yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you, Christian, for this. Absolutely, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Anastasia. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Anastasia. I'm from the SC Skopje. Currently, I'm five kilometers from Evzoni, waiting the borders to open and to go to get into the sea. But unfortunately, it is what it is. I would like to take back to the brain drain. What happens here? I also face that with the, the, the people from Serbia. I don't know for the other countries. I had the opportunity to work in, for a global corporation in Malta, which is EU. And what I faced was that I didn't like EU in that way that was there. So practically the white race, there is the race who owns everything, who has the finest jobs and who had the third world countries to get the jobs that they don't want to, of course, for very little money. On the top of it, they own all the real estates, the land and everything, which reminds us to another back in time society. The other side of this was that I don't have EU passport and each year going to uh, take my work permit, I was treated like I don't even have words how and people were staying there on 40 degrees outside on the sun, maybe 12 hours to get a paper, which I believe can be done online. And what if we step back and say, we don't want EU? What, what is the other option? I mean, we don't have the power to have a market, which already we have signed uh, with the World Trade Organization. So we are open market. And also we don't have very uh, much of resources and stuff like that. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, money. So I don't see an alternative to stay. We don't want EU. We can go to Russia, which on the other side still own us some money from the settling with uh, ex-Yugoslavia. And I don't see other options, but I don't like EU that way that I saw with my eyes. And uh, today, EU proclaimed like an open um, union with no borders at all. We saw that with COVID-19, everyone took care for themselves, close the borders. I don't care for you. I don't want you here. You go back to your country and your hospital should take care of you. So no solidarity, 
no humanism, altruism or whatever. And uh, really joining DM for me was like uh, fighting for some ideals and having uh, the, the wish and the hope for better tomorrow and better society. Thank you. Thank you, Anastasia. I think that was the feeling that we all had. And it's really the last straw that uh, we have. Um, Alexandra. Uh, hello, I'm Alexandra from Skopje. So I would like to sort of like connect some of the things that were already mentioned by Christian, by Anastasia. Uh, well, initially, uh, when we were discussing uh, about the topic of this uh, conversation, this was one of the questions that I wanted to pose to Yanis, uh, because like, especially with this uh, uh, COVID crisis, uh, the lack of EU solidarity was pretty evident and also lack of a, how to say, like structure, structured organization. Uh, and uh, with that, basically, uh, additionally, support for the EU uh, in North Macedonia dropped uh, additionally uh, because uh, people are aware of, uh, of what is happening. Uh, as Anastasia uh, also mentioned, the lack of solidarity was pretty evident. Uh, and additionally, I wanted to, uh, to connect with something that uh, Christian said uh, about the need for transformation. Uh, I would only like to add that uh, there is a huge need for transformation, but uh, always the transformation has to come from within. First from thyself, then from our neighborhoods, then cities, then countries, and then towards like bottom-up approach, then working towards the EU. So I think there is this uh, perception for uh, people living here that uh, if we join the EU, well, basically all of our problems will disappear, which is not going to be the case, of course, uh, because first uh, for uh, North Macedonia to solve uh, its problems, it has to work on itself from within, from the institutions, uh, but also from the from the people who work in the in the same institutions. Uh, so uh, that's something that I that I wanted to add. Uh, first, we need to work on ourselves and then work our, our way up uh, towards some some higher goals uh, because there are a lot of problems that we're facing corruption uh, also like in Albania what uh, Christian mentioned uh, we have a huge problem with uh, air pollution especially uh, problems with uh, with waste management uh, huge problems with uh, brain drain uh, because uh, there was a um, there is data from the World Bank because we haven't had a census in maybe something less than uh, 20 years. Uh, 500,000 people have moved from this country in search of a better life. Uh, that's basically a quarter of the population and this is uh, devastating for the country. Uh, there are cities here, uh, smaller towns, which are, which are basically empty. So there are a lot of problems that the country needs to work on and then uh, move towards the the accession process yes but it should be ideally a, a two-way street what eric mentioned there should be basically negotiations true very true uh, we have to deal ourselves with our corrupted governments with our rotten system and uh, to have any kind of fair or free elections, uh, we should uh, take care of the lists for the elections. Because I, I know for sure in Serbia, I'm not, I'm pretty sure that it happens uh, the same in other countries, is that we have people who died still voting at the elections we have people who left the country long, long ago, still voting at the elections, voting. So uh, these are all of the things that we would need to deal uh, ourselves, even without joining anything, you know, just 
being able to live with, with ourselves. Um, I don't have uh, any hands. Ah, Valeria, please. <laughs> Okay, sorry guys. So I'm waving because the technology and the 21st century and we are not quite compatible yet, but <laughs> we will be hopefully. And if you hear some screams or anything, I have three kids, it's late, I can't send them anywhere. So it's all right. So if you hear someone strangling someone else, it's okay. It's just ignore it. Yeah. I mean, quarantine and months here did its own so okay anyway i would like to to come back to some points that have already been said but maybe just to clarify um i believe eric was uh, uh, saying about uh, european union and united europe and the differences which we from the non-EU countries cannot emphasize enough and uh, must say that we very often hear uh, when we speak about Europe, that actually the DM members mean only the EU. Hopefully after four years, maybe something will change <laughs> or maybe finally the EU will just disintegrate so <laughs> or whatever. But uh, being uh, uh, talking about the disintegration of Europe, uh, coming from a country, so I'm already from Serbia, DSC Belgrade, sorry, uh, coming from a country that uh, exists for last 20, 30 years as uh, a result of a disintegration of a greater country uh, from Yugoslavia. Um, if you have a disintegration of, let's say, now European Union, then you can't see much point in uniting again. We have it here, you know, so it would be quite logical for our for ex-Yugoslav countries to cooperate much more and, and open the borders or whatever, but then, you know, everybody says, but why did we have the war? Why did we kill each other for it? So this disintegration and again, uniting is not an easy process. <laughs> so it's something that should have in mind when, when speaking about disintegration of the European Union and unifying the Europe again. Uh, that's one one thing I just wanted to make like a remark. Maybe someone would like to 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 talk about this more. Um, then, uh, for example, for us here in in um, in Serbia, we we focused very much on the Green New Deal, and in trying to apply it here in our context and in our laws and our everything, because. Uh, as as the comrades from Macedonia said, coming from a country where you have to have, you know, like the despot, like the dictator or whatever, we were we are very much focused on making a program that would attract people and not a person. So it is a very hard work, first of all, to make that program and then to to make people understand that it's not a guy who will save you, but it's a system. And if we want to make a system, we need to have good programs, right? We need to know what we are doing and how we are going to do it. And I think in all our countries, um, we are kind of like left oriented, right? Usually the immersed and everything. And the left wants lots of things like free education, jobs, I don't know, healthcare, whatever, but nobody actually knows how to do it. So we, we were very much attached to, to, to that part of, of DM. So having this Green New Deal that actually gives some directions, gives something. So, and we are trying to apply it to our context and we would very much appreciate any help that we can get. Um, becoming a part of the European Union, I think for many people now is not really like, I, I don't think people here feel it like a good idea anymore. Uh, and I think it's mostly because of the humiliation and, and also what Anastasia said, right? The procedures and everything for people are really humiliating. And even, for example, I remember now during this COVID crisis, uh, we received some help from, I don't know, China and some from Russia and some from the European Union. And then somebody from the European Union said that we didn't thank enough because our thank you to China was bigger to the thank you to the European Union. And then we had another humiliation where our prime minister had to say that our thank you to the European Union is bigger than, I mean, it's disgusting. Um, that's 
the other thing. And um, at the end, yeah, I, I think it's very important for us here in this, not just non-EU countries, but ex-socialist, ex-communist countries, to discuss a little bit about post-capitalism since it's becoming a pillar of VM, right? So I think it's very important to say something about this post-capitalism and its relation to socialism, communism, because people kind of automatically react, if not capitalism, then it's going back. That is like a step backwards because they're right, capitalism is the end of times and the ultimate idea of humankind or whatever. So maybe just to talk about a little bit about this relationship between what we already have now in capitalism and where we want to go, right? Like this evolutionary step forward and not back. And, and uh, just to emphasize that a little bit, I think it's very important to the people from these countries to hear it really being said. So I think these are my three minutes. Thank you very much. Perfect timing, Valeria, because now I wanted to go back to Yanis so he can try to answer some of our questions. Uh, but this post-capitalism pillar is, of course, very important for DM as a whole. Uh, but in terms of narrative, it is also uh, important for us to define what won't scare off people because opposite of capitalism is back to communism and then it's yeah, it's always gulag it's always gulag right yeah so people see like gulags opening up and whatever yeah so okay i'm muting exactly. myself now. <laughs> exactly so yanis the floor is yours thanks ivana um i will finish with post-capitalism um but i i shall start with um Something that I think is important to accession countries, um, a memory I have from um, Greece in the 1970s when we were an accession country to the European Economic Community. And I remember the, the, the question that was being asked uh, here in Greece was, now why would they ever admit us? What do we have to offer? We're a poor country, we have no natural resources, we have no industry, whatever industry we have is uncompetitive, which is all true, all was true and remains true. Um, so why will they let us in? Uh, and the, 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 bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie, the establishment always um, answered its own question by saying, well, because they're good people and because Greece is the cradle of, of civilization and because we sell the Acropolis and democracy and they want to have, you know, the, it's, like, um, it, it's like the Americans needing to have Capitol Hill as part of their territory because it's symbolically important, right? Uh, but that was, of course, not true. Uh, Greece, like you folks, um, had a very important asset to provide the European common market and the Eurozone later. It may very, sound very, very difficult for you to grasp, but it is true. Low levels of debt. Greece in 1980 when we entered the European Union, we had very low levels, especially of private debt. Just like you folks, you have very low levels of private debt. You have amongst the lowest levels of private debt in the world. You are the wet dream of Deutsche Bank. Because like the Greeks in the 1970s, right? You are poor compared to the Germans, to the Dutch. Huh? But, you know, whereas a Dutch um, sort of um, middle-class family has 1 million, 2 million euros of debt, you know, they are swimming in debt. They own, um, they own, they owe their, their house, their business, personal loans, you know, car loans, credit cards. Okay, people in Tirana, in Petovo, in, uh, uh, yeah, you have a small apartment, um, small income, uh, you probably own the apartment. Most people own their little tiny apartments. So you have an asset and you have no debt. This is, this is what a banker wants. They want customers who are cash poor, but asset rich relatively to their income. Because then they can give you credit cards. And the one thing that Deutsche Bank cannot do in Germany is provide credit to Germans because Germans have all these savings. They really don't want credit. So remember that 
when you hear about the accession discussions between Brussels and your governments and so on, what they want is to turn you into a dead colony like they turned us. And turning you into a dead colony is the greatest gift they can make to their failing banks. So keep this in mind, right? And for them, the Euro is a guarantee because the, they can give you money more safely for themselves if it is in Euros. And if you don't have a central bank and if your government, whatever democratically elected government you have, or, you know, dictatorial government, doesn't matter, has no control over your money, then they put you in their pockets, right? And it doesn't matter what your election, your electoral system decides. It really doesn't matter. They own you like they own us. Remember that, okay? Uh, that's one point I wanted to make about your countries coming from the Greek experience. The second one, which doesn't come so much from the Greek experience of uh, yesteryear, it is true more recently due to the MOUs and all that, but it is a more of an Eastern European phenomenon, is the mass migration, the desertification that ha is happening to places like, um, you know, Hungary, like the Czech Republic, uh, they're all leaving. And the reason, of course, is because on the one hand, we, as Demers, we love the idea of freedom of movement. And we, we're not in favor of um, uh, tariffs to impede free trade. This is not, we, we want to impede capital flows, but not free trade. Nevertheless, when you have a town in Hungary where the engines of the top-notch Audis, you know, German cars, are being built, and then they're sent, you know, 400 kilometers by train to Ingolstadt, which is where they are assembled. They are added to the chassis of a car. And the Hungarian Audi factory has the same productivity as the Ingolstadt German factory. But in Hungary, a month's salary is the equivalent to one day's salary in Ingolstadt. And I mean that. If you take all the costs involved, all the labor costs, including contributions to pension funds, this, that, and the other, right? Then, of course, you realize that if there is freedom of movement, why would the Hungarian engineer stay in Hungary and not go to Germany? Um, a rough calculation that an Italian, a very good Italian, one of the few good Italian economists did uh, yeah, about a year ago, uh, Fubini is his name, F-U-B-I-N-E, sorry, N-I, F-U-B-I-N-I, if you want to... Uh, keep hold of the name, uh, he, he, he calculated that there was 200 billion euros uh, of a net transfer of human capital from Eastern Europe to Germany over the period since the accession of countries like the Czech Republic, Hungary, and so on. That's 200 billion. That is a lot of money. Huh? It is a lot of money. It's two thirds of the Greek national debt. That it was human capital. So when they say they don't want a transfer union and they don't want euro bonds, they're quite happy with all sorts of tra transfers uh, that, that, that suit them, but not that. And the, the promise that your own establishment is making the people um, is very difficult to, to resist. Because you know, don't forget the symbolic, don't underestimate the symbolic importance of having an EU passport and arriving in Munich and not going through the aliens channel. You know, even if there is the, the, the Schengen dies and they still check, check your passport like they do in Britain, then they were never part of Schengen. Still, you line up with the civilized, not with the animals, not with the cattle. These symbolic values uh, are, you know, colonial. Uh, it's, colon it's just purely colonial power. Because this is, you know, how the Brits run India. They only had 20,000 soldiers in India. And they ruled uh, the, the, the whole continent through this symbolic capital that they distributed very cleverly between the, cast, the upper castes and the lower castes. And this is what the EU is doing. We, we must not forget that. <clears throat> okay. Um, before I move to post-capitalism, um, a few words on um, <clears throat> what do we do as DiEM25. Uh, campaigns uh, and so on and so forth. 
Well, one of the things that it would be very good to do is to organize a kind of DiEM assembly, um, a forum um, in Northern Macedonia, in Albania, um, in uh, Serbia. Uh, we are proposing it for Turkey as well, where we create a forum in which sophisticated debate can take place about the EU, neither against the EU nor um, you know, turning ourselves into cheerleaders. Uh, this would be you know, a magnificent contribution. We didn't have that in Greece in the 1970s. The Czechs did not have it or the Hungarians did not have it when they joined. Um, it would be wonderful if Diem could organize something like that, maybe through a teleconference, not involving just Diemers, but inviting people and maybe having a process, you know, not just a meeting, but a process with submissions and so on. I don't know. This, to me, that would be a, a, a genuine contribution to debates in your part of the world. Uh, also, uh, at a more radical level, it is important to identify conflicts, strikes, uh, confrontations at local levels, at a local level, uh, where some trades union, some community, some individual is being hunted by some oligarch, whether it's a Serb or you know, Lidl, the supermarket or whatever, or Amazon, and where we can, as DiEM, take a position and organize collective action in support of that particular person, of that particular trade union, of that particular organization, municipality, whatever. But you've got to identify that and bring it to us with it as a proposal for collective action. Uh, and finally, let's now go to post-capitalism. Well, capitalism is its own worst enemy, as um, Marxists always knew. The left is useless, you know, we are not a serious threat to capitalism. Capitalism is a threat to capitalism. Capitalism continues to invent the technologies that undermine capitalism. That was, you know, Marx's great contribution to the political economy. Um, that remarkable little pamphlet, which had the funniest title I've ever seen, a preface to the introduction of the critique of political economy. <laughs> So, um, you know, the, the 3D printer, uh, the internet, the you know, artificial intelligence, robots and so on, are creating a very serious challenge to the uh, to, to corporate structure. You know, what's the point of having um, a car company with its vertical integration hmm, from nuts and bolts all the way to the car? Uh, if you can have a 3D printer that actually prints the damn thing. And with electrification, the mechanical complexity of cars is, become, is, is, is going away. Uh, it will all be just a battery on wheels now. Um, far easier to manufacture without having the economies of scale. So it's not that we want to go back to something, you know, to the Gulag, to Gosplan, even though Gosplan had some, some important merits, but let's not speak to this now. The Yugoslav system uh, was even more advanced. Uh, but let's forget this for a moment now. The, if, you know, if, even if every man, woman and child made it their life's work to make capitalism work well, capitalism cannot work well because it constantly throws up and throws out a realization crisis. It constantly can produce a lot more stuff than the people who are producing it with the help of machines can consume. Uh, and you know, the, 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 and this disconnect between the available money and the amount of investment into the, into the things that humanity needs and even wants, this disconnect is going to get far, far worse now with the coronavirus crisis. So post-capitalism is coming to us. Uh, the question is, is this going to be a better system a system that is more consistent with uh, prosperity, with shared prosperity, or, or a dystopian turn of events. Uh, capitalism is going to be superseded. But the question is, you know, how and in which way? So unless, and this is, you know, unless, if we choose to become spectators to this process leading to post-capitalism, we're going to end up with a dystopia. This is why DiEM must, put a lot of effort into uh, firstly envisioning post-capitalism and secondly working 
towards the kind of post capitalism that is worth fighting for. Um, I'll just say a couple of things about how I envisage it. Uh, a lot more of this is going to, to, to materialize later on. I'm already put, you know, trying to find some time to, to write this up. Um, I should have it ready, I think, by the summer. Um, I want to live in a world where, you know, this, as Slavoj Zizek says, uh, I don't have the, uh, the KGB deciding um, my fate or what I eat or what I read. Uh, so uh, we, we, do, we, do, we do need markets in which I can exercise using my money, uh, the right of choice. That's, you know, that's not a neoliberal idea. That is an idea which is consistent with basic freedoms. But the problem with capitalism is that it's, it has destroyed markets because Facebook is not a market. It is a wholly owned world <laughs> in which you enter as an object and not just Facebook, but the whole of the techno structure as John Kenneth Galbraith used to call it. So to end up, to, end, to, you know, to, to, to just wrap this up, I want a world in which um, a corporation uh, has only one kind of shareholder, people working in it. So in, in exactly the same way as, as you enter university, you get a library card, you get one library card, you don't get two. You can't sell it, you can use it. I would like to have one share per worker, independently of whether they are the CEO, the all singing, all dancing, innovative engineer, or the, the person who is taking the garbage out. One person, one vote. Doesn't mean the same salary. You can have a, a, a basic income for everyone from CEO to whatever. And then we can vote between us. We can have electronic votes now. It's really very simple within a corporation to distribute the um, chunk of the net revenues of the corporation amongst ourselves on the basis of you know, brownie points that people get from their colleagues uh, on the basis of what contribution they made to the firm. And to the extent that they're self-interested people, they will want to give more money to the ones who are adding more value to the company uh, because otherwise they lose them. Uh, but that is a democratic vote, one person, one vote. Nobody can buy a, a share. So the elimination of, the sh of share markets, having corporations, one vote, one person, one share, and no share markets in the same way that you don't have the right to sell babies or votes and that this is a perfectly liberal notion, you know, liberals, I don't know any liberals who believe in selling babies. There are some crazies, crazy libertarians, okay? Or people who believe that you should sell votes. There are some crazy libertarians who think that too, but they are a tiny, tiny minority. We should start campaigning, you know, creating a narrative where people suddenly will realize that it is quite absurd that you should have the right to take money and buy a share into a company that you don't even know where it is, you've never visited. So that's, that's post-capitalism, a very important part of, of the way I envision post-capitalism. Second one is no banks, no commercial banks. Just get rid of them. We don't need them. They're, you know, they, they, they are a parasite. Um, we have central banks. The central bank should give all of us a free digital bank account. Really very simple. Imagine if we had it now. Um, if, if, imagine if the central bank of your country or the ECB in Europe were to give each one of us one or two or three as many bank accounts as we want. Huh? And you know, we, can, we, we can make payments through this bank account to anyone and we can have a second account to put our, uh, our savings in. Um, um, why do we need competition for that? It's digital. You just, just, it's a box. You put money in there. End of story. Right, and you have a pin, and you transfer it from one bank to another, bank account to another, um, within the same central bank or to another central bank. Now, immediately, immediately, yeah, think of what, how easy it would be now to deal with the collapse of incomes of the little people. What you do is you simply, you know, the central banker types, you know, two thousand euros in each bank account. Every, every bank account gets two thousand euros. So suddenly you can go and buy and buy stuff out there or even you know, through the internet, if you are locked up in your home because of coronavirus, and things get delivered and the, that shop doesn't die. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, let's think innovatively, but very simply as well. A central bank, publicly owned, 
um, um, network of bank accounts, one for, for each person. And you can have a very simple rule that says that every time a person gets born, in the same way that they get a birth certificate, they get an account with the central bank, and the central bank puts a certain amount of money in there in, for, for this baby, not in order to be used by the parents, but you know, it sits there, it accumulates interest. So when they're 18, 19, 20, they can do stuff with it. And we can find what under what rules they can withdraw it, you know. A trust fund. Why should Hil Paris Hilton have a trust fund and not everybody should have a trust fund? It's only it's only numbers. You just type them in, and that that, that money then gets recycled across the world. Um, so that's you know two very simple moves. You end share markets. You just destroy them by saying you, you can't buy shares, so there's no share market. And if you, of course, you can quit a firm. And when you quit the firm, right, you take that share of yours and you go to another firm, or you cash it, cash it out, right? Your company buys it from you, or gives it to another person, or you trade it to another person for a certain amount of money. But it's it, only when you leave the company. Okay. So now these are the kind of ideas that we should. When you start thinking in those terms, you are not going back to Gosplan. You are not going back to the Gulag. You're saying, look, this is. We're not asking for, um, you know, uh, storming the Winter Palace and chopping the Tsar's head off, even though that would be much fun. <laughs> um, what you say is, um, look, let's use the digital technologies that capitalism has created and create a democracy within corporations. By the way, the model of one share, one person who I vote is very close to the Yugoslav experience. Uh, and then I can add other pillars to it. You know, how do you... Um, manage uh, international finance, uh, but I don't want to bore you with that. I'm, I'm working on all those things. Um, and at some point I will put that, put something out to all of you uh, for discussion. But when I think of post-capitalism, this is what I'm thinking about. I think that uh, this resonates with us a lot <laughs> because uh, in 2017, when we went to Volksbühne and, uh, and had a workshop, it was learning from Yugoslavia. It was not about, you know, how we should bring it back and how great it was, but exactly to bring up the, the good things that it had, like uh, publicly owned commons and, uh, you know, no private possession, basically. And this self-management that very much resembles to what uh, you're describing. And uh, if we take out the KGB and gulags, maybe we could get an actual socialism. Uh, Milena. I think Zoran raised his hand before I did in his, no, you didn't? Sorry, I, I thought you did, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, yeah, this resonates with this audience particularly well. I didn't uh, introduce myself before. I forgot, I, I'm Milena from BSCW. Uh, but yeah, uh, first of all, yeah, that's, that is, some of the Yugoslav experience, but basically it's what Yugoslavia tried to do before nationalist elites tore it apart. It's what, where it was headed in the late 80s with the workers becoming actual shareholders, but it didn't pan out and it, it ended very badly, not because it was a bad idea, but because there were forces that were trying to, to destroy it. Uh, and this thing with abolishing banks, I think, means a lot to all of us that have credit in those banks. <laughs> so, yes, and uh, the interesting thing, uh, uh, even it just reminded me of that experience about the, the experience of Yugoslavia in Volksbühne in 2017, was that when we were talking about the disintegrating forces and the far right and the war that ensued, and we were uh, comparing like the rich north to the poor south. People in that audience who were basically very politically conscious people could not imagine that could happen to them in Europe in any possible scenario. Of course, it wouldn't be the same scenario, but, and that's what also happened in Yugoslavia. People in Yugoslavia, I don't know why I, I was merely born, but people in Yugoslavia in the eighties could not imagine that the country would be torn apart through war. And I think 
the, the threat from the far right is something that we have to take very seriously, even though it doesn't seem as, as serious at the moment. But I would um, uh, like to go back to, to the campaigns that we could do uh, for a little bit and connected to the issue of Eastern European workers in Western European countries. I read an article today by um, a Romanian author, I don't remember his name right now, who called them uh, proletariat with no country and no rights, which basically meant that uh, there was a hope that the EU would bring together everyone, but they don't have their own countries anymore, their sovereignty, and they don't have the EU because they do not have the same rights as the workers in the year, the, the, the title of, of the article is, I think, something, it's about asparagus affair and Romanian workers being dragged to Germany during coronavirus crisis to produce asparagus for, for German markets. So maybe uh, because DM will always be, even on the local level, uh, connected to Europe because it is a European movement. But maybe something about those workers who are forced to leave the country, to leave Serbia, to leave Northern Macedonia, to leave Albania, to leave Romania, to leave Greece, uh, to leave, sorry, uh, Bulgaria, etc., and go work elsewhere. I mean, there are those agencies that hire them and treats them basically as non-humans, as the cattle. And maybe that is a direction. And there are unions that actually advocate for them, not unions, but organizations. Maybe that is the direction in which some campaign uh, or Balkans campaign or Eastern European campaign or local campaign can go. Because that is the issue of both Europe and the very local issue of workers going abroad and living in inhumane conditions. Thanks, Milena. Uh, Zoran and then Vladimir. I'm mute. Wow, well, um, yeah, it's just brought up different things. Um, first, we're talking about realities on the ground, which are one world. <laughs> how do we actually sell and how do we actually uh, exit this big crisis uh, in a situation where we are right now in, in, in our little countries and then in the same term, you know, post-capitalism and the abolition of the banks and all the other stuff. Um, but uh, I, I guess we're living in the time that, um, yes, we are in, in these areas uh, on, on a really, really uh, low feudalism level, but in the same time, at the, at the same time, the world is changing so fast um, without even a war. And that's, that's something that came up to me uh, looking at this coronavirus. If you want to change the world system and, or if financial capitalism is coming to an end, um, the resetting or crashing of the economy without war, uh, I, I couldn't have perceived better scenario than, than what's happening right now. Um, when I say scenario, I, I'm, I'm not implying that it's, uh, that anything is uh, set up, but it's uh, definitely been used. Um, uh, to show the, the, the where the world is right now. And yeah, I, I think we might very, very soon uh, talk about all these uh, things uh, that, that Yanis was mentioning, like like the, like the future. Um, and, I, and I just want to come back to the, to the, to the previous uh, stuff that was said about, um, about the debt and, uh, and, uh, and, and the Greece and Serbia and North Macedonia and people don't have so much private debt and Deutsche Bank waiting in the wings <laughs> to, to, to come in and to, and to cash in. Well, again, it's connected to what's happening right now. <laughs> maybe, maybe we are a little bit more tough and we will endure uh, a couple of more months or a couple of more years and there might not be a Deutsche Bank anymore <laughs> before, before they actually come and do that. Um, as far as this part of the, of the world is, cause, uh, is concerned, um, there is not huge flow of financial capitalism. So I don't think capital flows will be a big problem. Um, the biggest problem I see, and that's maybe a question, um, I'm just hijacking this space to post that question so I don't have to post it afterwards. How would you help the countries in situation uh, like, like, like our countries? Uh, we do have a central bank. Uh, we do know what to do. Uh, we do have a clever, clever kind of ideas and, and monitoring fiscal policies, how to use the resources that we have and, 
you know, there's food, there's some energy, you know, the, the thing can be sorted out uh, um, from that point of view. But my, our problem is actually foreign on that, which was which was obviously done by the by the, by the design. Um, and we do have like 70% of our debt is, is, is issued. I mean, they issued euro uh, uh, bonds uh, on London Stock Exchange two days ago for 2 billion euros uh, and for 3.2%, the, the Serbian National uh, uh, Ministry of Finance. Uh, one question is who bought that, who actually gave money for that? Uh, I think it's the same people that are shifting money out through the offshore and actually buying it now for the guaranteed return because if they're in power, they can actually uh, uh, very nicely siphon 3.2% a year in euros. But uh, this, this, is, this is what I see like a major obstacle. So let me cut it short. What do you think is our ammunition or, or, or will there be a, a worldwide debt reset? And it's a, it's a sub question. Or if not, how do we actually uh, deal with, with that problem? Because obviously that, that is the, the big pawn on, 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 on a monetary sovereignty or anything that you want to do. It's, 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 it's this big dark cloud hanging over us, which is which is the foreign on uh, debt in euros and in US dollars. Um, I hope that makes sense. If not, uh, shout. <laughs> Thank you, Zoran. Uh, Anastasia and then Vladimir. So uh, first, I would like to mention maybe you everyone know but correct me if i am wrong i believe it was balashevich who said that uh, from the destroying of yugoslavia right Pfizer bank was the only one who profit and uh, more of these banks have their their branches here in our countries sparkas is in northern macedonia also NBG group and they make very big profits here. I believe that NLB Bank from Slovenia, uh, basically their only profit make from Macedonia. So it's pretty much strange when this is EU Bank making the profit here, not there. But they are pretty much protected from the government. So Practically, we all know how the, these things are going. They are financed, them, the parties, everything. And on the other side, uh, I would like to point out one question to everyone who is the, in the European Union thinking about Yugoslavia. I was very young, but it was um, destroyed. I was seven years old, but there is some feeling in me, I don't know for the others, when there is playing a national team, on any sport, I still cheer for our neighborhood countries. Uh, I would like to think about uh, going to Olympics as a European team of football. Do you think that Germans or French people can cheer the European team like we did for Yugoslavia, like Serbs and Croatians did for Yugoslavia? Do you think that there is such kind of uh, energy in this union thank you there will be when we are done <clears throat> so vladimir please so i want to add up on uh, uh other speakers uh first of all i want to to say that uh, we must use uh the experience that we had in yugoslavia well, whether it's going to be whether the bad or the, the good experience uh, because we, the, the bad experience was uh, collapse of the state and uh, financial crisis and wars so uh, if uh, European Union is not uh, uh, I don't know well organized in that uh, uh, it, probably some of the bad things are going to happen to European Union so uh, uh, and I want to uh, to to ask the, the CC or uh, uh, to use the experience of people that are coming from uh, Yugoslavia because Yugoslavia was uh, border on the Iron Curtain. So from one uh, eye, we were watching Moscow film and with the other, we were watching cowboy movies with John Wayne. So we know the experience of the two systems. So uh, we are the last two last generations that are born in the 60s and the 70s. So the last of the Mohicans so I think that we should use that uh, uh, use that experience that we had uh, in order to improve what DM is about. And I want to point it out, point out the 
the last prime minister of Yugoslavia, Ante Marković, had uh, uh, something uh, as very close to DM that he has now. He had uh, uh, local parties in each uh, country, uh, in each republic of Yugoslavia, just before uh, the collapse of Yugoslavia. Uh, it was called Union of uh, Reform Forces. Uh, I, unfortunately, he was beaten by uh, every, in each uh, republic, he was beaten by the nationalists. So I think that we should use that uh, experience in order to improve uh, what is uh, what is DM doing now. And uh, one point to because there are here four uh, uh, CC members, so I want to point out that uh, there is much energy inside DM uh, among the uh, members. Uh, we are uh, getting uh, up to 100 messages in the informal Telegram groups. So there is much energy uh, and. Uh, so we must find some topic or some uh, some action to use that energy. Uh, we are uh, we are good. Uh, everything is good. The program, the people, but we need action. More, more, a better organization and action. Uh, I would do, uh, I would take that uh, what Yanni said uh, uh, to make some uh, uh, forum. I would take that as a personal uh, agenda as well. So I think that we're going to have a cooperation, a good cooperation with uh, Belgrade DSC uh, about that. So uh, that was my point because this is the uh, uh, this is the time that we can speak to each other uh, from as a uh, normal member to the CC members as well. So thank you for my for taking it to concern. Thank you, Vladimir. And uh, now Alexandra, and then Eric, and then I would like uh, to go back again to Yanis for some set of quick questions. This is something new. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ivana. Uh, so I would like to uh, share a success story so that we brighten up the conversation maybe a bit uh, and connect to what uh, Yanis proposed. Uh, so uh, here in Macedonia, a couple of days before 1st of May, the government announced a measure uh, with which uh, the companies that uh, would apply for financial support from the government in times of this coronavirus crisis uh, would be allowed to um, to lay off to fire 15% uh, of the employees. Uh, and to this, a major uh, there was a, a backlash of major negative reactions, uh, and basically a lot of unions here along with uh, NGOs, civil society organizations, and organizations for protection of human rights, um, uh, collaborated, uh, issued uh, basically uh, 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 a remark, a reproach to this government measure, uh, which after a few days was revoked. Uh, so uh, this is one, I would say, tiny success story and a positive example of how joint forces with unions, NGOs uh, can um, can cause a, can cause a positive change. So basically, the, the government uh, revoked that decision, and uh, now companies cannot uh, fire uh, their employees if they receive government assistance in this uh, crisis. Something positive. That's good to hear. Something positive. Yes. Uh, Eric. Thanks, Ivana. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think it was Anastasia that uh, wondered if we could ever have, you know, a, a, a European football team with enough support <laughs> from the actual population. And I, I wonder if we should ever even want that necessarily, because, you know, the United Kingdom, they have still have England, Wales and Scotland playing football. I think it's important when you have a sort of local identity, not to trample that identity. And if we have a world in which the main difference we have as Europeans is the football teams, I mean, I'll, I'll be happy. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's it, it's a question of what is the, really this European unity project about? Is it about creating this one common cultural identity? Or is it more about forming a union of peoples based on sort of certain common principles, values, interests, and so on, and, and, and uniting people around those ideas rather than you know enforcing a new kind of identity, which 
bloody hell in Europe of all places will be quite quite difficult given our history. Um, now going back to to something that we talked about post capitalism. I remember before COVID, we were already talking about how the stars were aligning for you know really brave, ambitious new projects for what the world could look like. We were talking about how the, the climate change was creating circumstances in which the entire world would need to cooperate to survive. Uh, and if ever you needed, you know, a, a perfect scenario for, 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 you know, ushering forth a post-capitalist world, that was it. Now, dur after, during and looking at what is projected to be the world after the COVID crisis, I mean, that's too turbocharged. You know, the, this commonality of experience that we've all had, uh, the fact that all of our economies have taken a massive hit. Um, the, it, it, if the stars were aligning pre-COVID, now we are also being shaken by the gods and being told, this is your time, it's now, it's now. If you're going to do it, do it now. And all these struggles, you know, the Greens, the, the left, uh, liberals, all these struggles are being aligned. We all the things that we were fighting for in our own camps are overlapping majorly. So, in terms of a situation in which um, there can be a huge popular support for a new project, um, and it is not anymore simply a matter of justice, but a matter of survival, if you like, um, in a way that doesn't only uh, hit the weakest in society, but also higher strata, you know, the bourgeois and so on. Um, it is now. So although a lot of the things that we've been talking about here sound incredibly utopian, um, if ever there was a time to be very, very ambitious uh, with our thinking and with the plans that we make for the future, it is now. Um, and it is this kind of unitary uh, projects like DM25 that are perfectly placed for championing exactly this kind of struggle, rather than the crusty old parties that nobody has any faith in anymore uh, around Europe. So um, I think we should take faith from the fact that we seem to be on the right side of history right now, uh, both in terms of what we're talking about and also in terms of how we are planning on bringing it about um, and not to undermine our own ambition with, you know, questioning whether or not it is doable, but indeed take faith from the fact that it seems that if ever such a world was doable, it is now. Yes, <laughs> the time is now. Uh, now, I have Velko and Milos together in the Novi Sad and they have some questions. Unmute yourself, Yetko, and go Thanks. ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm Ilos Panko from Novi Sad. Uh, well, like other parts in the Balkans, Serbia is a country with a poor economy on the periphery of Europe, but also with the highest uh, coefficient of inequality in Europe. My question is about the adequate economic policy that could support investment but in the same time reduce inequality. From time to time, there are public discussions about uh, this matter in media. Uh, so uh, some domestic expert, uh, politician, analysts uh, mostly agree that fighting corruption is a major instrument and they're no mentioning uh, any other politics uh, uh, like uh, incomes of corporation, personal incomes, uh, or on the other side, their political spectrums are traditional left solutions that we should nationalize everything and establish major state control of the economy. Uh, there are not enough talk about uh, post-capital solutions, uh, so I would like you to about ask about some DM thoughts and ideas concerning the problem of inequality especially in the countries like Serbia. Thank you. Yanis, you can take one by one. And uh, then uh, the question is basically, how can we narrow this gap? 
between the incomes, which is uh, the biggest in Europe, basically, in the whole area. Well, the reason why uh, Yugoslavia, like much of Eastern Europe, um, experienced this stagnation with massive inequality was because you had a, um, you know, a lumpen ruling class that um, effectively um, chopped up whatever was of value uh, in small pieces, um, liquidated it, and uh, took the money out of the country. <laughs> in, in a typical mafioso kind of way. Um, the, the only answer to this is a combination of transparency and investment. So the question is, how can a country like Serbia, or any country for that matter, create homegrown investment flows? Um, you need to stop privatization, stop privatization. You need to create an investment bank which uses public assets as collateral, as its uh, capital, capital stock, not in order to sell it, but in order to uh, uh, lever it up and to create uh, the domestically induced uh, investments, link it up with um, you know, European institutions that are good, like the European Investment Bank, and maximize the investment in good quality jobs. And if Serbia does enter the European Union, then participate in the Green New Deal project so that we can all share 600 billion euros worth of investments in the green transition. I think that, um, you know, uh, but but that for that to happen, you need also to break down the dictatorial <coughs> political system. Uh, we need a movement that demands transparency from the municipality, the local council, all the way to Belgrade. <clears throat> I won't be easy. Anybody who does that will find very soon that their life is in danger, that their character is assassinated. It's not going to be easy because you know the the, the greater the poverty. And the greater the inequality, the greater the toxicity created by a very morbid and cruel ruling class. Um, you have that in Serbia, we have it in Greece. Uh, you know, the, the lesser, the less developed parts of Europe are a bit like that. Um, can, 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 I, can I crack a joke, please? In response to the, it's 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 actually a, a a true event, one of the funniest moments of my life. Um, it concerns football. The question, you know, can we have a, a team of footballers representing Europe or more than one countries? Uh, mind you, I would never want to coach it. Can you imagine? <laughs> if you had to have a federal team, one German, one Greek. Anyway, um, I was in the European Parliament. Um, some many, many years ago. I don't remember what year it was, 2000, 2001, long, long time ago. I was in the European Parliament, uh, invited by the Greens back then, and went there, we had sessions, and talked, blah, 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 Green New Deal back then, uh, Eurobonds back then, European Investment Bank, Bank back then. I'm sick and tired of hearing myself say the same things again and again. Anyway, so at some point I had, we had a break. So I was in the cafeteria. Eric, I've told you that, right? I was in the cafeteria and there was there, a, a, an Austrian member of European Parliament was there uh, with the name of von Habsburg, the last descendant of the Hab Habsburgs. No, true, it, he was the last descendant of the Habsburgs. He, he died a few years ago. He, and he was an MEP for Austria, okay? And I started chatting with him and he introduced himself to me and I, you know, I thought, this is intriguing. I'm talking to the last Habsburg. This is like a movie, right? Behind us, there was a screen and there was a football match playing. And there were others sitting around us. It was a large table. Uh, people came, brought their, the, the, the awful EU lunchbox uh, and horrible coffee. You know, anybody who's been in that building knows what I'm talking about. And, and somebody, not, not from Habsburg, who was much more interested in having a discussion about the European constitution and all that stuff. Somebody says, uh, who is playing? And um, some, and, and the answer that another person gave was uh, Austria-Hungary. And Habsburg says, against whom? Okay, <laughs> I thought, sorry, I wanted to share this. <laughs> we can completely understand. <laughs> okay, uh, so um, 
what was the other question? I forgot. <laughs> Uh, well, maybe we should uh, finish in in this um, cheerful way. And now that you told us about the post-capitalism and how we are going to cancel the banks, we are uh, going to make a confession here that uh, 2017, when five of us went to Rome, we took the loans from the bank, mm -hmm. counting on you canceling the banks. No, 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 we would not. No, <laughs> no I'm not kidding. Anyway. You still be able to, to take loans because that is important. We need that even in post capitalism. Uh, we, you need to have a capacity to say, look, I have a liquidity problem. Um, I'm, I'm, that it lubricates even a socialist economy's wheels. Um, and we're not going to, you know, let's be completely liberal. You know, there's no need to ban the banks, they'll just die because. Think about it. If there's no share market, that we ban. We ban share, trading of shares, like we ban trading of babies. It's really very simple. Okay, it's not that, it's not allowed. What can we do? Um, but if you have no share markets and everybody has a free bank account, digital bank account with the central bank, why would you ever go to a commercial bank? Why would you ever open a bank account with a commercial bank? They charge you for everything, and they won't give you anything that the central bank won't give you, right? The commercial banks play two roles under the contemporary capitalism. One is, um, it's a system of payments. And if you don't have a bank account, you can't make any payments. But if the central bank gives you a bank account, you don't need that. So that goes. The second reason is because they use the investment um, branch of the bank, like you know, JP Morgan. And what does an investment bank do? It raises money using certain financial instruments to fund bets on the stock exchange. But if you ban the stock exchange, this, the, the second purpose of commercial banks goes. So we'll be completely liberal. If you want to have to set up a bank and to you know ask customers to come and give you money, do it. No one will go. No one will go. So they will just fade out. They will become extinct without any ban on, on commercial banks. The thing we need to ban is the share market. Even better if they're extinct. Valeria. Um, okay, I have two short questions, um, more for like narrative purposes, but I, like I need a precise answer. <laughs> Um, it, it concerns us from the non-EU countries and non-Euro countries, right? So the first, I will, I will ask them, like, not like a DMR or whatever, like someone, like an ordinary person, right? So from the ground. Um, so what to say to someone now? Why is it not better for us now to stand in that line with the EU passport, but in the other one. Oh, that so would be the first. There's no, no doubt that it's better to stand in the EU line. It's nicer. So we don't have to say stupid things. Everybody likes, um, everybody likes um, a, 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 you know, an EU passport. Uh, I like it. The question is, what price are you prepared to pay for it? Are you prepared to pay the price that Greece paid? for being a member of the euro, you know, losing 750,000 of your young men and women uh, because of the harsh austerity that is imposed. Uh, are you prepared to turn yourself into a debt colony, to lose any chance of ever having a government that can actually have some degrees of freedom? Do you, you, know, do you think that your EU passport is more important than that? Um, how about entering into a kind of legal framework where your government can no longer, can no longer nationalize the banks and um, cut your debt. Is this worth the EU passport on the EU passport line? So, you know, it's up to you. We, we must be liberal. We say, make your own choices, but know that there is a price. There's no free lunch. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the other one would be kind of the same, but like, you know, people here think that although we have the dinner in, in, in Serbia, uh, but you know, my rent 
is in euros. My salary is in euros denominated in dinners. Um, everything is basically in euros, but we just calculate them back to dinners and then we calculate them back to euros and everything. And then people say just, so why don't we just have that bloody euro and get done with it? That's no, it very, sounds logical. That is a very, very good question. The answer is because if you do have a moment of truth like Greece had in 2010, right? You can denominate everything in dinners. Um, your gov think of the sixth, you know, of the fifth of July of 2015 in Greece, right? Uh, by having the euro, the, the, the you know Frankfurt can simply switch off your banks. Switch off your banks. Now that's an act of war. It's an act of war. When you have a foreign power that can shut down your banking system and you don't have even dinners to trade with, you know, the old lady cannot go to the shop to buy milk because the Frankfurt people decided to switch off the supply of whatever currency there is. Okay. Uh, again, think it's not that you, you know, ah, we already have the euro. No, you don't. You have everything denominated in euros, and you know maybe the dinner goes uh, down, and therefore you, you have inflation in dinners. But you retain the capacity as a society to say no to Frankfurt without losing everything. I try to tell her that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's better from your from your. <laughs> no, but it's important to to be yeah. said. It is, you know. Thank you. There is a baby. <laughs> <laughs> now we will mute Valeria. Okay, uh, I've got to go to my baby, who is my dog, and he needs to go for a walk. We all need to go, and uh, this was really inspiring and energizing. And thank it you so great. much for being here. It's great to, to be together, you know. Um, long live the, live the Ottoman Empire. I, I, I said. <laughs> Or the Byzantine Empire, you know, let's be more Greek, the Byzantine, which of course never existed, it was the Roman Empire. Milena is Byzantinist, yeah, Roman... so you just cancelled her job. <laughs> so, thank you, thank you everybody, and see you soon. Thanks, guys. Thanks everybody, thank you.